Good morning, hope you're all okay. Um, it's Friday the 29th of July 2022. Uh, for those, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Heidi Maver. I'm the founder of EO Class Matters. I work supporting families of children and young people who need to access education. Bespoke packages of education because they cannot attend school. But more than that, I am someone who has a trans young person in their life. And I have also worked very hard and continue to work hard to increase understanding and acceptance of uh, the struggles faced by trans young people and their families. So I want to talk about that this morning. Um, a large number, comparatively speaking, of people who access our services have children and young people in their lives who are trans. And that's because there's a significant intersection between neurodivergence and gender um, differences. Um, that's not unusual. Um, it ties in with the, well, the theory is that it ties in with people who are neurodivergent do not tend to be as bothered about conforming to social norms. And as a result of that, are perhaps more willing and more open to discuss their gender incongruity, which means... Um, uh, being a, a gender other than what you were assigned at birth or other than what people might assume you to be. So I want to talk about this today because if you support my work and if you find my work helpful and if you have benefited from the work that we do in our group, then I really hope that you will listen to this and that you will give this some thought. I want to start by saying I'm not expecting everyone to understand all the intricacies and nuances of trans rights. And I'm not asking everyone to agree with me. But what I am asking people for is to give this a little bit of time and space to think about what it's like for families of children and young people who are trans or non-binary and the impact that particularly the debates that are currently happening around the leadership contest for the Conservative Party are having on those families and especially on those young children. And regardless of your personal politics and opinion, I would ask you to remember that when I'm talking about trans young people, I'm talking about some of the most vulnerable people in our society. I'm talking about children and young people who face discrimination, overt discrimination and hate on a daily basis. And actually the stats show that the majority of people in the UK do support and um, the rights of trans people to have access to healthcare and access to safe spaces. And that actually the small number of people who are whipping up anti-trans hate just move around a lot. But generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that most of us want what's right for kids and young people. And most of us want to protect kids and young people. And that extends to trans kids and young people. So I want to talk a little today about uh, Liz Truss especially. Um, yesterday she spoke at the first mustings if that's what it's called hustings whatever it's called for the tory party leadership and if you want to share this you're welcome to share this um and uh, she spoke about a number of things but it's really unfortunate that the leadership has become a conversation about trans issues like since when is this the most important issue in our society? And I say that as someone who loves a trans young person. There are much bigger things that the leaders of, or potential leaders of political parties should be discussing. And the reason they're going for this is because it's low hanging fruit and because they know it's a, a vote winner and because they know it's the kind of thing that will get people talking and it will get headlines. So they're literally from the get go using our children and young people to get clicks. So that's the first thing to say. So she spoke yesterday and um, I'm quoting from a piece in LBC, which is actually a pretty anti-trans piece, but it found I found the bits where she'd said what she'd said. Hustings, thank you very much. The attacks from the government to try to weaponize and hate trans people is terrifying, yeah. They are bringing about debates and hate just to divide us all. Why would anyone feel threatened by pronouns? Thank you, Sarah. So I'm going to dig into this a little bit today. So these are some of the things that Liz Truss said. She said that it children, um, and, and the language is really intentionally um, inflatory. 
that's the word. So she said children, what she means are under 18s. And the trans person that I love in my life is under 18. So children should not be allowed to change gender or make irreversible decisions about their bodies. Okay, that's the first thing she said. I'm gonna talk about that in just a second. She also said that she wants to see a return to single sex toilets. Um, and she says, I've been very clear that single sex spaces should be protected, particularly for young people, as well as vulnerable people, vulnerable women in domestic violence shelters, for example. And I can assure you as prime minister, I would direct that to happen. It's a difficult time being a teenager, being a young girl, and you should be able to have the privacy you need in your own loo. So I 100% agree with you and I would make that happen. She said, of course, schools should be sensitive. They can provide additional facilities, but it should not be at the expense of protecting young girls. And the piece says that um, it is, uh, what's it say? Uh, understood or believed that um, cisgendered, uh, some children are believed to be avoiding using toilets at school because they only have access to gender neutral facilities. Okay, so there's a number of things here. First thing I wanted to say was, as an adult who has a trans young person in their life, so the young person that I'm speaking about, when they were born, uh, they were assigned female, so they're identified as female. They have um, the, the genitals of someone who would be identified as female, okay? Um, and we want to really be clear that we're not, sex and gender are two different things, okay? So we're speaking about gender identity and gender. And someone can have, uh genitals that are you know someone can have a, a vulva for example and still be male okay that's the way that gender works gender and sex are two different things okay so no one is saying that the person that i'm speaking about is sex their male their sex is male but their gender is male okay and um they have pursued um affirming therapies and affirming treatment for that because they actually went through a female puberty now what i wanted to say about that was as someone who knows and loves a trans person in this case an assigned female at birth now male presenting trans person what i didn't understand before i went through this process was one of the most difficult times for a trans person if they are already um, out as trans or if they already identify as trans or if they've already got the language to know that they are trans before they hit puberty it can be extremely distressing to go through a puberty that makes the physical characteristics of your assigned gender or your sex more prevalent so if you are someone who has female sex organs and you are male so you feel male in every part of your fiber of your being. You are identified as male. You are recognized as male by the people around you. You use a male name, you use male pronouns, for example. And then you hit female puberty. That is deeply, deeply distressing. And one of the options to young people is that they can access um. And they can do this on the NHS if they get on the list early enough. I mean, their waiting list is four years, but they can in the UK access puberty blockers, which would delay puberty to such a time as they were later in their life and they could pursue gender affirming treatment and or they can access hormone treatments. So they could, instead of having a female puberty, if they're assigned female at birth and have female sex organs, they could instead have a male puberty. That, that would be a, a hormone induced, chemical, chemically induced male puberty. And the treatments we're talking about are the kind of treatments that are used, for example, in HRT, right? So they're not like some kind of Frankenstein, uh, kind of like weird chemical messing with these. They're the kind of hormones, basically for people who are assigned female at birth, who wish to um, have treatment that affirms their gender as male, it's testosterone. And, you know, in the case of the young person that I love, um, they apply a testosterone gel to their arms every night. And that has brought on male puberty. Now, what I want to say about the whole thing around gender dysphoria. So gender dysphoria is a diagnosis that you need in order to access gender affirming therapy. 
And gender dysphoria and being trans are actually two different things. So being trans is, is when you are when you are not of the gender that you were identified or assigned at birth. Experiencing gender dysphoria is the distress that goes with that experience. Not all trans people experience gender dysphoria and not all trans people choose to or need to access hormones or treatment. And the recognised treatment for gender dysphoria is hormone therapy or one of. And the reason for that is because the discomfort, the distress, the mental health crisis that is brought on by existing in a body that is not aligned with your identity is so significant and so damaging that it is recognized that in order to address that and to help you feel more comfortable in your own body and to bring your body in line with how you feel and how you are as a person is to allow you to have access on occasion, sometimes not always, to hormone therapy and sometimes not always to bring on a puberty that is in line with your gender identity. And what I want really people to understand is that in and of itself, being trans is not a mental health disorder, inverted commas. Gender dysphoria is the distress that is experienced by trans people by not being able to present in the way that they feel they are. OK, so if you imagine, I can't even. It's about being able to show up in the world in an authentic way. It's about being able to be yourself. And we spend all our time telling our trans and young people, tra our, our young people, kids and young people, trans and otherwise. I'm just looking for a plug, sorry. That it's important to be yourself, right? It's important to be yourself. But then we say, but, but not if that means that you're living an agenda that you weren't identified as at birth. Like that's the exception to one of the exceptions to that rule. The other exception to that rule is be yourself, except if you're autistic and that makes other people feel uncomfortable. And many trans and non-binary people are autistic. Sarah says, my child is non-binary. She's so also trans. Uh, why should any politicians have say over how they choose to present or live? We're struggling a lot with puberty and it's a really common experience. And the stats for children and young people who are non-binary and or trans experiencing mental health crisis as, an, as a result of gender dysphoria when they hit puberty, which then can and does and quite often, I've got crumbs in my cleavage, um, lead to um, thoughts of self-harm, acting on self-harm and sometimes, and it's not that rare, um, attempting to take your own life. I was going to put this on on it on YouTube, but now that I'm digging crumbs out of my cleavage, I probably just made it inappropriate. Um, so for my trans young person that's in my life, um, what that looked like for them was initially moving from presenting as female, um, having their hair cut, wearing clothes that felt more aligned with their gender identity, and then pursuing a gender dysphoria diagnosis, which then would allow us to unlock access to support um, for hormone treatment. And they have been on um, testosterone since October of last year. Um, and they have been through um, a male puberty, their voice is broken, they have developed body hair, um, there have been other physical changes. Um, and they are, you know, gearing up for would like to be able to have um, top surgery whereby their female sex characteristics i.e their, their chest is changed and altered to be more male appearing and um, not all trans people pursue surgery in fact quite a small percentage and not all trans people pursue um hormone treatment but what liz trust said was that she did not want or she wanted to make it not possible not possible impossible is what she's saying Get it up. <sighs> that children should be allowed to make irreversible gender changes. So anyone under 18. So any child or young person that goes through a puberty that is not in line with their gender identity should not be allowed to do anything about that until they're 18. 
with that assertion, it's already difficult, very difficult to access hormone therapy. Like I said, the waiting list for the NHS in the UK is four years. Um, and that's for initial appointment. So if you are over 15, you won't ever get seen by children's services. You'll get transferred to adult services when you're 18. We have hundreds of children on waiting lists to be seen by gender identity specialists on the NHS who cannot access treatment. And all the while they're experiencing significant mental health um, crises as a result of that. So she wants to stop that. She wants to make that impossible, right? But then she goes on to conflate that conversation with a conversation about toilets. And this is the thing that annoys me as someone who is a trans ally. It always comes down to fricking toilets. So I wanted to give you a bit of an insight into what it's like as a family when you have a trans young person in your household and what that means in terms of toilets, right? Because there's lots of conversations about we need to protect single sex spaces. Now, I'm not saying we don't need to protect single sex spaces. Um, I'm not saying that that isn't something to be considered, but not at the cost, not at the cost of trans people. Find a way to make spaces accessible for people of all genders, right? And this idea that gender neutral toilets are in some way putting cisgendered people at risk is a complete fallacy. And it's tied into the narrative that trans people are sexual deviants, sexual predators, aggressors, rapists. None of that is true. None of that is true. And even if it were, allowing trans people into your bathrooms does not put you at more risk. Because even if it were true, which it isn't, that trans people are all rapists, paedophiles, whatever you want to say, telling rapists and paedophiles that they cannot go into a particular space does not make them less of a risk, does not make them less paedophilic or less rapey, and it does not prevent them from accessing those spaces. It doesn't. In the same way that making it illegal to break into someone's house does not mean that we don't have burglaries. People who are going to commit crime will commit crime regardless. And the idea that a sign on a toilet door will stop that is utterly ridiculous. Right? I'm going to address that in a minute, Christina, because that's a really important question. Let me just look at, I'm going to talk about toilets and our experience of toilets in just a second. Cat's going crazy. She wants to go out. I don't think many MPs give a toss about children being able to feel safe or have authenticity. This is true. This is true. Trans teens are not here for the convenience of anyone but themselves. They have the right to be themselves, however they feel. Age isn't an issue, ignorance is. And this idea that anyone under 18 does not know their own mind is utterly repugnant to me. And it's what we see in the SEND space time and time and time again. We don't believe that children can have autonomy, um, which is rubbish. There absolutely needs to be gender neutral toilets. My non-binary young person really struggles knowing which loo to use and feels scared or judged. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is interesting. I don't know who this is from. Oh, Sarah, I worked in a school with gender neutral toilets. They were massive open plan area and actually violent incidents around the bathrooms reduced. You know, there is a protective element of gender neutral toilets because it reduces the risk of bullying because more people are using those spaces and we know that bullying attacks happen in school bathrooms we know that for example when cisgender boys are bullying cisgender boys those attacks happen in toilets and the same for cisgender girls when cisgender girls are bullying cisgender girls those attacks often happen in toilets if you've got gender neutral spaces and it's an open plan space with all cubicles there are more children and young people in those spaces for longer because generally speaking people who sit down to pee take a bit longer and it's actually protective because it reduces the risk of bullying in bathroom spaces because there are more people around and we know that people who are assigned male at birth or people who are cisgendered men or boys act differently when they have people who are assigned female at birth or cisgendered women around them. 
So actually, it's safer to use gender neutral toilets. So I'm going to speak about this, Christina, because this is what's coming up. So let me just tell you a little bit about one of the proposals that Liz Truss is, is saying she'll do is that she will make it so that every public building, new public building, has to have single sex bathrooms. They have to have a male bathroom and a female bathroom. And so organisations that are building new buildings will have to do that. And because space is limited and bathroom space is not um, income generating space, generally speaking, bathrooms are not particularly high on the agenda in terms of floor plans. Right. It's like you do what you need to do legally and so that people have somewhere to piss, but you don't spend a lot of time, energy or effort to make sure that those are the, the biggest and most, you know, the best spaces in the building, which is ridiculous because people care about toilets, toilets and food. That's what people care about. But anyway. So if the changes come in, as Liz Truss is proposing, new buildings would have male and female toilets, right? They would not be required to provide gender neutral toilets. So anyone who is either presenting differently to the gender they, assigned, they were assigned at birth or is on the spectrum of gender identity, which means they don't identify with the gender they assigned were at birth or do not look like the gender they were assigned at birth, will have to use the toilets that potentially they'll have the least worry in. And this is the case for the young person that I have in my life. So they now generally present as male. Most people, they don't get misgendered very often. Most people, when they meet them, know that they're a boy. And we went through a period of time before they started on uh, gender affirming treatment and when they were at the beginning of their transition, when that was not the case. And they still presented quite feminine, particularly their voice. And the anxiety that that caused around using public toilets was horrific because you can't just anyone a young person, think about when you've been to concerts and you, and if you're someone who's assigned female at birth and female presenting and you've thought, oh, well, I'll use the men's, it feels really naughty. You, where are you going to get told off or attacked or whatever it might be, right? And you're like, oh, no. <laughs> sorry guys, I need to use the loo, whatever it might be, right? It's that times 5,000 when you are a trans person. So, for example, there's a young person, it's not my young person, but there's a young person that I know currently who is non-binary and, um, or was non-binary, but are now presenting as, uh, identifying as male. And there are other children in their life that know that they're a boy. And an event, a, a regular activity that they all go to together, one of the younger children had questioned, why does this person use the girl's toilets? They're a boy, Right which is great because that means that those kids are identifying and recognizing and honoring and respecting the fact that that child is a boy. However, that child is very early in their transition and do not yet feel comfortable using the men's bathroom. And they need to be able to continue to use the female bathroom in the meantime. But actually the response of the organization was, you're going to have to use the men's bathroom now. Because you're a boy, we can't have you in the girls' toilets. If there had been gender neutral toilets, that would not have been an issue. So for us as a family, when we go out places and my child, young, young person needs to go and use a bathroom, an adult needs to go before to see what the situation is. Why are we generally eating Wagamama? <laughs> because Wagamama have gender neutral stalls um, and you just go in, they're all individual spaces with a loo. Um, but someone needs to go and scope it out ahead, right? And someone needs to go and see like what it's like if it's a if it's a single sex bathroom, where the urinals are, because my trans young person finds it difficult to be in spaces where urinals are like right there when you walk in the door. Um, so there's a lot going on, right? But more than anything else, there's this thing of, oh, well, you can use the disabled toilets then, right? 
this extends to not just toilets, this extends to changing rooms. So when my trans young person goes swimming, we have to find out what the changing room arrangements are. And it's not sufficient to check that there are disabled changing rooms because very often disabled changing rooms are inside gendered toilets or inside gendered bathrooms or changing facilities. So in a swimming pool, they're like, yeah, we've got disabled toilets, but they'll be in the male only space or in the female only space. And that's the same with toilets. So when people say just use the disabled toilet, sometimes the disabled toilet will be in a single sex space. So you'll have a load of you'll have the ladies toilet for example you'll have a load of stalls and then you'll have a disabled toilet that still means that a trans person who is male but is assigned female at birth would need to go into a single sex space to access that disabled facility besides which disabled facilities are intended for people who have access needs generally physical access needs so not only have you got the issue of are you going to be challenged on being in the wrong bathroom you've also got the issue of are you going to be challenged for using an accessible toilet when you're not obviously disabled when you're not visibly disabled the anxiety around that i know from speaking to other parents the number of children and young people who are trans and non-binary who literally don't go to the bathroom anywhere else but their own home because of the anxiety around it I know of children and young people, I know of one young person in particular who was hospitalised with a kidney infection because of that, because they held needing to urinate so long that they got unwell. And that's because they don't feel safe in bathroom spaces because of this bullshit, like the kind of crap that Liz Truss is peddling. So not only am I here to say that trans people are not paedophiles, not aggressors, not sexual deviants, not rapists. I'm here to say that in your efforts to turn conversations around bathrooms into a conversation that peddles that narrative, you are hurting children and young people who are trans and non-binary. You are preventing them from a basic human access need, which is to be able to piss in peace. Rest assured, guaranteed, trans people using bathrooms are not interested in anything else other than getting in getting their bladders emptied and getting out as quickly as possible. It is not a pleasant experience. It is anxiety inducing. It triggers gender dysphoria. It can be very distressing, especially if you are challenged. And when you layer on top of that, that you might have a neurodivergence that means that you find open public spaces even more difficult, you can begin to see how challenging this conversation can be for trans and non-binary young people. And... As someone who is someone who loves a trans person, for me, having my trans person go to the bathroom is also anxiety inducing because I'm worried about whether they're going to get challenged or attacked or spoken to or upset or distressed by their trip to the toilet. And I can't accompany them because they use a men's bathroom. If we had gender neutral facilities, that would all be negated. If people could, here's the, here's a, a radical idea. How about a toilet that everyone can piss in just like the ones we have at home? Because last time I looked, there aren't very many public home, private homes that have male and female bathrooms. Correct me if I'm wrong. Actually, when I lived in a student house, we did have a designated boys bathroom because they're smelly. So just going back to this question, Christina saying, why not have one for each sex and a neutral one? And like in an ideal world, that would be perfect, Christina. Like no one is asking for every toilet to be gender neutral, although that would work for us as a family. But if Liz Truss gets through what she wants to get through, which is that all public spaces must have single sex bathrooms, then the lack of space will mean that they will not provide gender neutral ones. If on the flip side, the requirement was that all spaces or public buildings had gender neutral toilets, then they could find extra space for male and female toilets. But genuinely, I can, I can guarantee you this. If you have used a public bathroom in the past month, you have been in a public bathroom space with a trans or non-binary person and you would not have known it. You would not have known it. So what are you going to do? Like, how are you going to decide who has access to these single sex spaces? Are you going to have mirrors on the floor and get people to pull their knickers aside? 
like what the hell what they're actually saying is they don't want people who don't present in a set gender identity in single sex spaces so then what happens to those of us who like in my case i'm a tall woman um i have been in the past mistaken for a trans person um more than once so are people going to challenge me when i go in bathrooms because i look like i could be a trans man i mean a trans woman sorry i'm not it wouldn't matter if i was but what's going to happen are you going to have people you know like deciding that they don't like the look of someone they think someone is not feminine enough or not masculine enough like is that what we're moving towards because it feels like it is feels like it is let's see what this client says there's absolute needs to be gender neutral toilets my non-binary young person really struggles which knowing which loo to use yeah exactly and you're right sharon it is down to space and money like shut up Christina, maybe the government can put a scheme in place to help businesses create a single gender neutral toilet in organisations that can't afford to do it. Maybe they can, but if Liz Truss is Prime Minister, that will not happen. It won't happen. It will not happen. And in fact, what will happen is we'll have less and less accessible spaces for trans and non-binary people. Sarah. On any days out, we need to think about outfits and what would be the easiest. Yeah. Although we tend to go to Costa when they need a bathroom because it's neutral. Yeah, exactly. How, like, trans people having to dress to be able to pee quickly, right? So they can get in, get on the loo or wherever they're going to pee, get out again quickly. Ridiculous. Like, it's not ridiculous what they're doing. It's ridiculous that they have to do that. These are things that you have to really think about and that you don't need to think about when you don't have a trans or non-binary person in your life. Karen, this is really eye-opening to me. Unless you've been in a situation, I don't think you have any idea how difficult it can be. No, true. Sharon, by making them use single-sex toilets and not use the one they feel safe in, they're putting them at higher risk too. Yes. Yes. Um, our school ha now has inclusive toilets. They've renamed the disabled those, but it's a huge step forwards as a mindset. Yes, it is. Yeah. I mean, here, Sarah, imagine this. Let's blow their minds and let every toilet be disabled and gender neutral toilets. Imagine the progression. Like, really genuinely. That's what we, that's what we would need. That would be perfect. If all toilets were accessible for all people, that would be perfect. We're a long way from that. A single toilet can fit into a cupboard space. True, but who wants to piss in a cupboard? Like, it's that thing. It's it's kind of, it, it reminds me a bit of the breastfeeding debate. Like, oh, you can always just feed your baby in the toilet. Why should you? Saying to a trans or non-binary person, oh, you could always just use the disabled toilet. Okay, but I don't identify as disabled. I don't want to. I just want to have a pee. Safely, without worrying that someone might challenge me. We have such a lot of work to do on this. And it's so fucking depressing that the potential future prime minister of our country, and let's be honest, it's looking very likely she will be the future prime minister of the toilet, of the, of the, of the toilet future prime minister of the country has this has this position on trans rights or actually believes that trans people should not have rights in the same way that cisgender people should you know she has this thing of oh you know trans people should be respected but not at the cost of cisgender people like, holy shit. <laughs> Future Prime Minister of the Toilet. Yeah. So what I would really like, I would really, really like, if this is something that you have energy for, would you send an email to your MP? You can find your MP really simply 
Um, you don't need to do anything beyond say that you're concerned about this issue. Um, so if you go to this, this is your find your MP place. One of the things that has been, I've really learned over the past few weeks, well, months actually, when I've been doing some lobbying, lobbying work, is that we tend to write to our MPs when we when something goes wrong. So when we, you know, fall off a curb and break our neck or I don't know, whatever might happen when something is serious. But actually MPs, they represent us in Parliament and we have to let them know what we're thinking and what we're feeling. Their, their job is to represent the voices of their constituents. It's really important that we make sure that they know about the feeling, public feeling. And by writing to your MP, you are doing that. And it doesn't even matter if your MP will not agree or will not do anything. They have to pay heed to letters that they receive. And if more of us did that, it would make a difference because they literally cannot ignore us. It cannot ignore us. Um, my MP is Philip Davies. He's so far right against disabled and trans rights. It might make him back her. I don't even care. Like it couldn't be worse. It couldn't be worse. My MP is a Tory twat who has as much use as a chocolate teapot. And they're your MP. They work for you. I would really, really love it if people would just send an email to their MP saying, I'm really concerned that um, the conversations around the leadership debate for the Tory party has become a battleground to undermine the rights of trans and non-binary children and young people. What are you doing to make sure that that doesn't happen? You'll get a cut and paste reply, but it will be logged. It will be logged and they cannot ignore it if enough of us write to them. Less than 0.1% uh, of the population, less than 1% of the population, 0.1% of the population are trans and non-binary. They are practically invisible except when they are politicised and used for personal gain by politicians and authors and whoever else. Like, it's not enough for us to leave this on the trans and non-binary community because there are enough people in that community to really make a groundswell. And if you really are uh, a, an ally, I would really beg you to consider writing to or emailing your MP, just to even say, I believe that trans people should have basic human rights and that you must be respecting those things. Isn't it against human rights to enforce this into an individual who identifies other than the gender they were born with? So gender reassignment is identified as a protected characteristic under the Equalities Act. But in order to uh, benefit from that piece of legislation, there has to be proven discrimination based on your gender identity and you have to be officially transitioning. Um, so for many people on their trans journey, that would not apply. And actually proving that you've been discriminated against because of your status as a trans person is extremely difficult. Um, and unfortunately, in many instances, the police don't take it seriously. I've reported two hate incidents and neither of which have been logged as anything other than we'll put it on a log. Um, one of them was pretty ser serious and the police officer didn't even, didn't take it seriously at all. So, yes and no. <laughs> there are very few laws in place to protect trans and non-binary people. There are much stronger laws to protect cisgendered people who want to access single sex spaces. Maybe we could have a template that we could share on local groups to try to increase pressure because I believe most people do support trans rights, but those in power don't want us to see this. That's true. I'll see if there's anything on the gender, gender equality, uh, gender intelligence website. They usually have good resources. They may have something. Um, to help us to contact our MPs. I'll see if I can find something. 
If you can't um, write to your MP and you are in a position to make a, do a donation to an organisation who do work um, with uh, trans to support trans and non-binary people of all ages, but especially do a lot of work supporting children and young people, Gendered Intelligence are my preferred charity if you want to make a donation. That would be amazing. Yeah, that's it, Sharon. If you've not spoken to your GP about it, you're not protected under the Equality Act. We've got such a lot of work to do in this space. And, you know, the biggest, the biggest challenge that we're facing is that our trans and non-binary children and young people are being so badly let down that they are taking steps to end their own lives. Um, and we've got to do something about it. We've got to. Such clothed mindset, isn't it, from Liz Truss? Very insightful. Wow, the police, you should have treated you. Yeah, I know, I know. Didn't have the spoon. Your personal experience and open honesty based on your personal experience is huge, bigger than you might even have any idea about. Firstly, thank you for helping me understand more. And secondly, please put this on YouTube, crumbs included. <laughs> okay, I will download it and put it on YouTube. I've got to go and make a phone call because I've got to go and see if I can have a conversation uh, for something for one of my EOTAS families. So I'm going to go. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, you know, it, it means a great deal to me personally as a parent and as someone who loves a trans young person that people give us time and space to talk about these things. You know, it's you cannot underestimate the incredible impact it has to have a trans or young person in your life trans or non-binary young person in your life who sees the media around these issues and who says things to you like why do people hate me why do people hate trans people it's not something you ever want to hear out of the mouths of a teenager and it's not something you really have an answer for. So thank you for listening and for supporting and for being a decent human being. And like I say, you don't have to understand it all. You don't have to agree with me on everything. But I really hope we can all agree that we all owe our children and young people of all genders better protection. And we need to take care of them. And the narrative around um, access to safe spaces for and treatment for trans and non-binary young people is hurting them. It's hurting them. And it's not okay to be telling trans kids that they are hated. It's not okay. No kid should ever hear that or feel that. I'm going to go. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a lovely day. Um, and uh, if you do need help, if you have a trans or young non-binary young person in your life, um, then like I say, Gender's Intelligence is a really good place to go um, for help and support, um, as is Mermaid's which I will put the link up for. They support uh, gender diverse children and people. Put that up on screen so you can see that too. There you go. All right, thanks everyone. See you later.